Hello everybody at the Warwick Economic Summit 2014. I'm John Vickers from Oxford University. I'm very sorry I'm not with you in person, it just didn't work out, but I'm very fortunate to have the chance to talk for five minutes um, to you in this way. And what I want to talk about is some of the aftermath of the financial crisis, where we had the peak of that crisis five years ago. We had the initial response, which was governments all around the world in crisis management mode. Um, enormous public resources were thrown at the problem. You had huge changes in macroeconomic policy from central banks and so on. And we've still got super low interest rates, quantitative easing and all the rest. But the thing I want to spend these few minutes on is the longer term question about how are we doing at repairing the financial system? And in particular, I want to talk about the process of reforming the banks. And I got very much involved in that when in 2010, so it was uh, almost four years ago from where we are now, I was asked by the newly elected government here in the UK to chair a commission, there were five of us on the commission, to come up with proposals about how to make the British banking system safer and also to try and come up with ways of making it more competitive because one of the casualties, another casualty of the crisis was competition among the banks themselves. Now in these, these few moments I'm going to focus on the first issue there, the financial stability question, and talk about what we recommended, what was the economic thinking behind our recommendations, and say a bit about where we are now in terms of the of government and parliament um, bringing some of our recommendations into effect. I'd also say a bit about the much wider global context, because although the UK is the most important player in financial services in Europe, we are in an international setting and our recommendations had to be crafted uh, for that. So let me begin. When you're, when you're asked to try and come up with ways of solving a problem, um, just like if you're a doctor, the first thing is diagnosis. So what were the key elements in the, in the diagnosis of what went wrong? Now, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how um, bubbles uh, in the economy, for example, in US subprime, grew and grew and grew, they burst, damage all over the place. Uh, for me, one of the really shocking things about the crisis, which began in 07 and then hit its absolute peak in 08, but the, the aftermath is still very much with us, was that that, that shock caused damage on a scale that was um, unimaginable. Because instead of a robust financial system that could bear the shock, we had cascading events when you had those huge US institutions, Lehman Brothers, AIG and others, falling over and these collateral damage effects which threatened in those early days in in october 08 for example really threatened very ordinary high street banking um, here on the other side of the atlantic and in various other parts of the world so why was the damage so great why were there so many billions of taxpayer uh, taxpayers money needed to be thrown at that problem just as crisis management and i think there are two very important factors there which apply to the banks. One is that they had been operating on incredibly thin layer of their own capital. So they were lending and doing other um, sorts of activity, giving them exposures to, to risks all over the place. All sorts of geographies, derivatives, commodities trading, market making, as well as the ordinary banking that, that you and I need. And when they started to take a hit on some of those uh, that lending activity, those assets, the derivatives, the commodity positions, and so on. Some of them are operating with um, capital, that is their own money, owner's money at stake, only say 2% of the exposures that they had. So if you lose 2% and you've only got 2% capital backing you, then you're, um, you're about to go underwater. And you might think, well, that's okay because there's other financial support for banks, the people, the private sector that's lent them money. Trouble was that those people would only lose money if these institutions were allowed to go into bankruptcy. And governments weren't going to let that happen because um, the consequences, economic, social, imagine if the ATM is just, you know, all stopped, uh, there could be really calamitous effects. And that's why to stave off that, you had huge amounts of taxpayer money go in. And here in the UK, RBS remains mostly state-owned, 
and, and Lloyd's is um, a big chunk of state ownership uh, still. So far too little capital in the banks, much um, greatly insufficient ability to bear losses. Second point was the banks were seen as having structures with no fire breaks. So a bank could lose money on the other side of the Atlantic, another part of the world, or on an activity totally unrelated to high street banking. And that could jeopardize ordinary banking activities, the kind that governments really do want to make sure stay running um, in, a, in, in a very scary way. So not enough capital um, and structures with no fire breaks. So what did we recommend? Well, um, the Independent Commission on Banking, which I chaired, our two main headings of recommendations were addressed at precisely those things. Get the banks to have much more capital. Now, the international move is in that direction, but we don't think it goes far enough, so we were trying to push further on that. We're also very keen to try and set up a, a credible system where the providers of debt finance to banks would bear loss. This goes under the technical name of bail-in debt. We were very keen to get the ordinary deposits as remote from loss taking as possible. That's called deposit of preference. And that was one set of recommendations. The other, which we're probably best known for, is called ring fencing, which says ordinary high street banking, current accounts of individuals, small businesses, for, the, for substantial banks, those have to be in a separate subsidiary from the activities like the market making, the trading, the commodities, the derivatives, exposures to other financial institutions and activities um, uh, as it were on the other side of the world. So ring fencing is uh, you can have all those activities in the same banking group, but the retail activity has to be in a separate safe entity with its own capital and plenty of capital, independence, its own directors and so on. Now where are we in the reform debate? Well, just a couple of months ago, uh, the, the Parliament here in the UK passed a Banking Reform Act, which basically achieves those things. Some of the measures are not done by the law, they're going to be done by other means, but the, the structure in law for ring fencing is now in place in the UK. Deposit of preference, the regime for this bail-in debt, sounds very technical, but could be extremely important. That's all in place in this new law. As is, um, as are an, another set of reforms, there was a parliamentary commission followed ours, some of their recommendations too. So we've got this new law in the UK. Does that by itself solve the problem? No, but it's an incredibly important platform. It doesn't by itself because all the regulations have to be made under the law. We're in a big wide world where international events and policies matter greatly too. But I think it puts the UK in the forefront of reform internationally. There's been a lot of reform in the US too. I wish that the rest of Europe um, uh, would have similar energy behind this. Whether it will or not, I think that remains to be seen. Where are we five years on on banking reform? I think some pretty good progress, but tons of unfinished business. So we could only say that policymakers around the world have done um, a really good job if this first five years of reform goes a good deal further in the next five. Thank you very much.